Good morning and happy Sabbath Woodside Church family. Today is April 23 and I'm recording this for Sabbath, April 24, 2021. I hope this message finds you well and that you're able to sense God's presence with you today. Today I have a sermon about the kings of Israel and Judah. It's a really hard sermon to preach. It was not an elegant and exactly faithful time for God's people, uh, but I think we can find messages to help us strengthen our faith today. Will you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Loving God in heaven, we thank you so much for the amazing grace that has always been available to your people. And now as we open your word, as we try to understand the nature of this choice, this choosing a king over your will for your people, we ask for lessons of faith to be relevant to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Obedience is faith that is motivated by love, but works is belief that is motivated by fear. We see that contrast time and time again when we examine the biblical record. Because you see, when Israel chose a king over the judges and over their prophet, they chose to set themselves up as God. And this is part three in our series of histories, mystery, finding faith in the Old Testament, because it's really important for us to understand that we all are saved by the exact same grace that the Old Testament faithful were saved by. In our first sermon in Eternal Rescue Plan, we looked at the faith expressed by Moses and how he interceded for the people and was a type of Jesus Christ. History's delivery cycle showed us that Joshua was faithful and wanted to have a covenant with God's people. And he asked the people to choose this day whom you will serve. Well, today we, and, and we also looked at last week, the faith of Rahab and the amazing faith of Ruth. Now I'm going to look at with you today, the incredible story of the kings of Israel. You see, um, Samuel was a miracle child and all great stories start with a miracle child. And when Hannah dedicated Samuel to the Lord, first Samuel, she sang an amazing song. I want to just point to that song very quickly here because we have various songs in the various versions or various uh, tales of the Bible. And when Hannah sings her song, she says this amazing thing. My heart exalts in the Lord. This is 1 Samuel 2. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Hannah's prayer exhibits exemplary faith. And when she brings her son Samuel to the temple, he is acknowledged and affirmed as God's prophet. Now we come and we are going to act one now. We're going to scene one in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And we're going to look uh, very quickly here. Because Samuel did not raise his sons to fear the Lord as well. And it says in verses 1 and 2 of 1 Samuel 8, and it became, it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now, the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Failure of leadership led to the elders of Israel gathering together at Ramah, Samuel's hometown, and asking for a king. And God allows them. God says in First uh, Samuel 8, verse 9. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. So God is endorsing their decision, but he's also setting them up with the warnings that were given in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20, where Moses warned the people that kings would become oppressive. And the adoption and the anointing of Saul, his reluctance to lead, really bore out. 
And so now we're moving on to scene two in 1 Samuel 15, where Saul is commanded by God to slay the Amalekites. He says in verse two, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. Do not spare him, but put to death both men and women, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Saul is told to completely kill Agag and the Amalekites, yet he does not. He does not. And when Samuel arrives on the scene, verses 10 and 11 describe what Samuel says. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has just turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have command I'd carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Verses 26 through 29 are signal. Because Samuel says to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And he goes on to talk about how the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. That neighbor would be the son of Jesse, David, and he would be anointed as king. But we see here a tension and something that arises throughout this whole period of history, which goes from 1085 to 586 BC. You see, prophets and messengers were sent to urge God's claim upon the husbandmen. But instead of being welcomed, these men of discernment and spiritual power were treated as enemies. The husbandmen persecuted and killed them. God sent still other messengers, but they received the same treatment as the first, only that the husbandmen showed still more determined hatred. Prophets and kings, the introduction to prophets and kings. And so it sets up this tension that exists between authority, because the kings are given coronated authority from God, yet the prophets are trying to call them into a covenant relationship with God. And so we arrive here on scene three at a cave at En Gedi, where David is hiding from Saul. And we are in 1 Samuel 24. Verses four through six. You see, David is anointed. He is affirmed. David, Saul has slain his thousands. David is ten thousands. And Saul just cannot abide that. And so he goes after Saul. It goes after David, excuse me. And in 1 Samuel chapter 24, it's told Saul that David is hiding in En Gedi with his mighty men. And when 1 Samuel 24, verses 4 through 6. 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 4 through 6. The men of David said to him, Behold, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I'm about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. See, Saul climbed into the same cave that David was in. And the men saw, how fortuitous. But David says, David cut off that robe, but he said in verse five, it came about afterwards that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. Very important to remember here this incredible distinction, this, this difference between David and Saul. You see, conscience is a safe guide only if illuminated by the light from above. Saul's conscience was darkened, even seared 
with a hot iron of jealousy and envy. David's conscience had been under divine training, and like Paul's, was to a large degree void of offense. Having been given the divine unction of spiritual discernment, he had proved himself a true leader. He was not dependent on the customs and traditions of his day, but possessed a knowledge of that which was divinely and intrinsically correct. The conscience that pricked David was the faith by which he lived. And that the distinction was made him different from Saul. So the difference between Saul and David is examined there. Now we go to a cave at Endor, where Saul's death is prophesied by a demon. Here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. You see, the Lord had not responded to Saul. He had asked by the Urim and the Thummim. He had asked uh, for uh, signs from the prophets. And because Samuel had died. And so Saul goes to the witch at Endor. And in verses 16 through 20, for Samuel 28, Samuel is quoted, but it's really a demon because the woman just tells Saul what she sees, and Samuel perceives that it's Samuel. It's not really him. But these verses, why have you disturbed me? Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has departed from you and has become your adversary? The Lord has done according as he spoke through me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, to David. It's the exact same phrase here that Samuel uses. The devil was watching. The devil was very involved with the corruption of the kings of Israel. It's a very sad thing. Very, very sad thing. And when we consider the Next step, the next story, it's very sad. Because when Samuel makes this prediction, Saul immediately fell full length upon the ground and was very afraid because of the words of Samuel. Also, there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day and all night. The epilogue on Saul is that in the Battle of Mount Gilboa, Saul and his sons are slain, and the Philistines desecrate his body, but the men from Jabesh Gilead rescue his bones and burn his bones, and thus ends the house of Saul in Israel, thus ends the first king of Israel. I apologize. Here's an epilogue on Saul. Kingship in Israel had had a poor beginning. Saul had begun his reign as a magnanimous ruler, but his independent spirit drove him into repeated acts of disobedience, which removed him farther and farther from God, and finally brought him to a sad and shameful end. Poor Saul and, and Jonathan. And so we close out Act 1, Saul, the first king of Israel. And I'm going to skip David, and I'm going to skip Solomon, because there's so much there. But David uh, had his moments of glory and his moments of corruption, as we know, with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite and so on. He had a very, uh, I mean, a, a civil war basically break out in uh, Absalom, in the case of Absalom. But then Solomon also had challenges. And here we come to the divided kingdom. And this is still in the time when Solomon is alive. First Kings chapter 11. Solomon is still alive at this point. And there's this mighty man named Jeroboam, who the prophet Hijah comes to 
verses 35 through 40 of 1 Kings 11. Nevertheless, the prophet says, <clears throat> let, me, um, let me back up here. Then, um, then Ahijah, oh, sorry, verse 29, excuse me. It came about at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Sholonite, Shalonite, found him on the road. Now Ahijah had clothed himself with a new cloak and both of them were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of his own new cloak, which was on him, and tore it into 12 pieces. He said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give it, give you 10 tribes. Jeroboam has promised the kingdom from God. He's of the house of Joseph, of Ether, Ephraim. Another man that God tries to set up and, and empower to the best of his ability. And he says here, he makes a promise. Then it will be that if you listen to all that I command you and walk in my ways, do what is right in my sight by observing my statutes and I command, as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build you an enduring house as I built for David and will give Israel to you. Jeroboam was prophesied to take the northern tribes. Yet, when he comes back, and Rehoboam has an opportunity too. Rehoboam has an opportunity. home has an opportunity to be successful for God. Rehoboam and Jeroboam come together with their forces, and they are about to fight, yet God turns them away. Kings 12, 21 through 24, all of these people are gathered together. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, speak to Rehoboam, son of Solomon. You must not go up and fight against your relatives. So they listened to the word of the Lord, returned and went their way according to the word of the Lord. God stopped the civil war between Jeroboam and Rehoboam. There were other battles and everything like that. But here's, and, and Rehoboam is told, look, lighten our load. Solomon oppressed us. We would like to have a lighter load, but Maria Bohm listened to the younger counselors and ended up having problems in Judah. Now, Jeroboam the first, he is coronated at Shechem and set up as king, yet he doesn't do what was right. It was God's purpose through the nation of Israel to give a demonstration of the absolute superiority of the God of Israel that would eventually lead all nations to seek after the God of the Hebrews, but the kings could not accomplish this. And so Jeroboam sets up these golden calves, like literally the exact same idol that the Israelites formed at Sinai. And it's a great desecration to God. He says, um, and he spoke to them, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. That's uh, Rehoboam, excuse me. And here is, uh, now behold, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord while Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. This is false altar, the golden calf. And the man of God cried against the altar, said, O altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. This was fulfilled by Josiah. Second Kings chapter 22 and 23, recount the reforms of Josiah. In the ninth year, and, and Israel 
the northern ten tribes, they are all wicked kings. There's one Jehu is kind of good, but mostly evil in the northern kingdom. All evil kings. In Judah, there's four good kings and four uh, sort of right and evil kings. The rest of them evil. And so the real message out of this whole period is that as the leader goes, so goes the country. As the leader goes, so goes the country. And so the last king of Israel is defeated and taken by the Assyrians. Second Kings 17, 6. This is a description of what happens to God's people during the exile. And in 17, 6, in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried Israel away into exile to Assyria and settled them in Hala, Hebar, on the river of Gozan in the city of the Medes. And it says right there in 13 and 14 why they went into, why they went into uh, the exile. They served idols concerning which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this thing. And so scene two ends with the destruction and the disbursement diaspora of the northern 10 tribes. But we have a prophet named Habakkuk still in Judah where Josiah makes reforms. Jo Judah lasts a little bit longer than Israel, but they are still captured. And their capture is foretold in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a prophet during the time of Josiah. And he asks a question, but behold, no, no, no. God speaks to Habakkuk in Habakkuk 1, 6. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. God foretells that Babylon is going to come and bring judgment on Judah. In verses 13 and 14, Habakkuk asks, your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up these more righteous than they? Why have you made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a river over them? The Chaldeans bring all of them up with their hook, drag them away with their net, and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Rebecca Gaslam, is this really your plan for us, dear Lord? And then the Lord responds to Habakkuk. In Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4, Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal and will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Habakkuk is given the summary of the faithful within the Old Testament and those within the period of the kings. Because works is believed that is motivated by fear. And the kings of Israel feared the Lord in an unhealthy way. But faith is obedience that is motivated by love. And works is belief that is motivated by fear. Let's ask the Lord to have a pure, obedient faith motivated by love today. Shall we pray together? I'm going to close with this prayer from Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit, that I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Is that your prayer and your desire today, friends? I pray that it is yours, and I pray that you grow in faith. Thank you for joining us today. I apologize for my sniffles. Allergies are really bad, but I'll be there and looking forward to seeing you. Next week, we're going to be 
recording the service in the sanctuary. Uh, so I will not be uploading these on Friday. We'll be looking at a new format for uploading for the virtual audience. Thank you so much for your time today. And I want to just uh, make sure that I close with a greeting. And thank you for joining us today. God bless you, friends.